gives me for my uh, cold opening uh, sins. I've pressed the big blue button, which means, in theory, we are live. Um, live, and the technology, in theory, is also working. Um, everyone, hello, welcome to tonight's rail. Welcome to the, the evening show. Uh, we've got people already landing and arriving and saying hello in the chat. Good to see you here. Um, Theoria Frankos has joined us, which is incredibly exciting. Uh, Thea, is that, uh, forgive me, I, that is, I should have, the other thing I should have done before we, uh, before we open the show is I double check that I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Theo Rio Francos, is that correct? You're actually pronouncing it correctly, which is a rare feat. Oh, that's good. Um, good. I, I did, I did look up a couple of your lectures, um, to make, to where you are introduced to try and check that it, there was a, there was, it was a correct pronunciation. It's not actually a hard name to pronounce, but it's, it's, it's always, it's always good to check. Um, anyway, I digress. Uh, we are tonight talking about, yes, it's episode 169. We're talking about achieving zero emissions with more mobility and less mining, which is the, a straight filch of uh, one of Thea's uh, lectures, actually. I've just taken the title uh, exactly, which is a little confusing because actually I'm going to mostly use one of your other presentations that is um, titled differently. Um, we'll talk about that momentarily. In the meantime, yes, so the theme uh, is going to be, well, we're talking about these things a bit. Uh, good grief. Um, yeah, that's right. It's enormous EV Hummers and, and why these, some people seem to think these are the future. The, the, the UK Department for Transport certainly is one of the um, organizations that believes this is the future for transport. Um, and um, the implications of that are this. And we're going to talk in some detail about what those implications are and why those implications are severely problematic and destructive. And there, I'm not sure there's any better person to have on to talk about this, frankly, um, which is incredibly exciting. Um, and uh, but that's that. But but who is it? Who, how is this going to discussion going to go? How 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 long are we going to go? We're not. It's running a tight episode. I promise everyone in the chat. Thea, I promise you, it's a tight episode. I've already taken up an hour of your time because of uh, the the UK having weird time differences. So without further ado, we'll bring Thea in properly momentarily. It only remains for me to say, welcome to tonight's rail letter, everyone. And as the Intercity 225 fades away, and I forget where I'd clicked, so I entered the uh, uh, the intro music a little early, but that's fine. It's it's the, it's the start of the show. Um, I am going to immediately bring up, uh, before we press on and talk about these two presentations and how we've smooshed them together, I'm going to bring Thea in. Thea, thanks, thanks for being so patient in the background while I jitter around beginning the show. Um, <laughs> Thea, thanks so much for joining us. It's it's a it's a genuine pleasure to have you along. Um, yeah, Thea, likewise. I, yeah, I, I, it's it's. I, I'll let you introduce yourself. That's the first thing to do, and, and and I'll let you introduce yourself fully, and then we'll we'll crack on. Okay. Well, I'm Thea Rio Francos, um, and I'm a professor of political science, and I'm also a member of the Climate and Community Project, which is a kind of lefty climate think tank through which I produced some of the research that we'll be talking about today. Um, yeah, that that is me, and I'm super excited. I've been researching resource extraction for a long time, yeah. but in the past few years, I've taken that interest to intersect with the the um, kind of energy transition and and decarbonization of transportation. So I think it seems we have a lot, it, it uh, seems look, look yeah looking at your background, it seems like you've pulled like you're, it's reaching the point where you're pulling in a lot of your like everything's kind of coming together really quite quite nicely yeah, the intersection of falling apart yeah yeah something like that yeah <laughs> yeah the intersection of geopolitics and 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 and, and gr well green extractivism as you as you call right. it which I, and green capitalism which i think are really quite neat ways of we'll get there in any case um it's worth saying so these two presentations um are kind of have been have been kind of um sausage machined into this it, it what is really probably about an hour and a half or two hours of material sausage machined into a one hour uh, podcast which is sort of the style of the, of the show but i think we're going to manage it these are brilliant and it's it's worth it's worth everyone going and read looking up and reading these these presentations well versions of these presentations are available online i think you've i think you've delivered some of these lectures and they've been recorded as well so people can go yep. and find and i strongly recommend you get that because you'll get then get well firstly you get all the source ma source material the papers the references uh, all that good stuff um but without further ado i think let's let's kind of get on with it really and, and we start the story 
um, well, in fact, you start the story um, in uh, Salar de Atac Atacama in Chile, um, which is um, one of the most beautiful parts of the world. It's a salt flat. Tell, tell us about this. Firstly, tell, kind of briefly tell us about this place and, and, and what's what's happening. You know, what what is happening here? You know, we have this beautiful view. But if I jump forwards, um, what are these pictures? What's happening here? And what are these surreal sort of sci fi looking um, uh, pictures all showing us? So um, the Atacama Salt Flat is in northern Chile in the Atacama Desert, which is the driest and also oldest desert on Earth. It's a really just amazing, amazing place in, in northern Chile. And it also is the source of about a quarter of the world's lithium, right? And we'll maybe get into what lithium is, but in, in short... Uh, it's an essential ingredient in lithium batteries, which are in turn in electric mobility, right? Electric vehicles, electric bikes, electric buses, all of that has lithium in it. And a lot of that lithium comes from Chile, from, from exactly where we're looking. And so the salt flat is this beautiful, expansive um, flat ringed by Andean mountains. Some of them are volcanic, right? It's a very dramatic landscape. And underneath the salt flat, are these natural deposits of brine, like salty water, like the ocean, but actually saltier than the ocean. And suspended in that brine is lithium. So what these, what we're looking at are the operations of two major mining companies, SQM and Albemarle, that have yeah. operations on the salt flat. And they basically pump out the lithium brine and they array it on these evaporation ponds. And a lot of the, the water part of the brine evaporates and then the rest uh, uh, becomes a concentrated form of, of lithium, which is then converted into lithium chemicals and then makes its way into batteries through global supply chains. So this is kind of the beginning or one beginning of the global supply chain of, of electric mobility. And it, it really just shows, I think, dramatically, like this kind of contradiction between mining and beautiful and very worth preserving natural landscapes and, and watersheds and habitats. Yeah, these incredibly unique, salt flats are an incredibly unique and, and precious uh, you know, landscape and, and kind of biome. Um, yeah, I, it's also very difficult to get. I mean, I was trying to find pictures, you know, ex extra pictures to throw in to give an idea of the scale. So the, the picture I put up at the start of the episode was one that I thought almost captured, but it's almost impossible within an image to capture the scale of, 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 it's of these. It's, the, it's, like it's, it's enormous. And actually, you know, in, in one set of researchers has said that these are in a way the largest mines on earth if you think of the fact that the whole salt flat is involved in the mining yeah. operation right that that's you know it's it's a slightly perhaps dramatic or exaggerated way to put it but it does give you a sense right and i'm i'm in a i live in the united states as is probably obvious from my accent and i'm in a, a rhode island which is a small state the smallest state in the us but just to say this salt flat is two thirds the size of Rhode Island, right? Yeah. This is a very large piece yeah, yeah. of land um, that we're looking Absolutely. at. Absolutely, and there's this juxtaposition with these, you know, this this you know, viewable from satellite imagery scale right. of, of of industrial operation with, with as we've said, you know, these valuable biomes, some of the most beautiful parts of the world here. You know, so uh, Los Flamencos National Reserve here and, and the right. salt flats in Chile. It's just, you know, these are beautiful areas. And you said, I think the point you, you make is this is 19 miles from these lithium installations. It's like right, exactly, next door. Exactly. And we see these flamingos, which are endemic to the area. And in general, in the world, salt flats are very important for migratory birds, right? And so there's a whole complex ecosystem that, as I mentioned, this is the oldest desert on Earth, right? So there's also a lot of knowledge to be gleaned about like the evolution of life on Earth from some of the microorganisms in these lagoons and in and in that briny uh, uh, sub subsurface water as well. So there's a lot of habitat, scientific interest, um, and just, you know, beautiful landscapes also for yeah. ecotourism, which is, you know, a relevant kind of uh, sector in, in the area. Yeah, absolutely. So, you, so, so this, it's, you're kind of, this, this is a really nice, well, not nice, it's kind of a savage, brutal way to, to, to frame the, the discussion. And indeed, it, it's not just about nature. It's, it's about the fact that, that, that there are populations here, people live exactly. in these areas, you know, so you've given some examples of some of the, some of the types of, uh, of kind of local subsistence that are happening right. again uh, very close by right um so you know ringing this this salt flat are 18 distinct indigenous communities that are also organized into an indigenous organization um and they they have a variety of forms of livelihoods i mean i should say that many people in these communities work in the mining industry not just in lithium but chile is is the world's number one copper producer mm -hmm. and a lot of those copper mines are also nearby so there's multiple extractive kind of stresses on the environment 
It's also worth noting that copper is itself an energy transition metal, just like lithium, right? So, so there's a lot going on in the realm of green capitalism. Um, so there are there are folks that are working in these industries, but there's also subsistence and small scale agriculture. And in general, people's lives are being impacted by the kind of big environmental and water footprint of these industries at the same time, let's just not forget that they're all being impacted by climate change, right? Like any yeah. of the world's deserts, this region is getting drier and hotter and more erratic in terms of temperature and, and precipitation, right? So there's a lot of simultaneous things going on that I think gives real insight into the kind of material stakes in many ways of the energy transition on on in in specific places where the supply chains touch down. I mean, I, I, for fear of of, of uh, you know time rolling on, I, there, there's one thing that's really that, that I do want to touch on is it, that often doesn't get talked about, which is uh, the availability of water. It's critical resource for us to survive, and it's an inc- these are incredible. I mean, we saw the pictures; these are incredibly water intensive operations you know they rely on evaporating enormous amounts of water up into the atmosphere um, and and getting rid of potable water otherwise another factor that has to be thought of not just impacting the the local populations but also the just general global supply of of, of drinkable water um Absolutely. yeah frightening so um and it's uh, yeah and so the whole contest here is like clearly we do Clearly, there needs to be a, a an energy transition. We are transitioning away from burning fossil fuels. This, we're not. We're not. This is not a pro fossil fuel podcast. If anyone's joined us who is a pro fossil fuel person, you're in the wrong place. Sorry, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about making the right transition, isn't it? it it's about the right making the right decisions for the future, and not Absolutely. not kind of stumbling our way, as you say, the green capitalism. This kind of the business as usual, stumbling our way into another uh, environmental catastrophe uh, planet wide. So, let's talk very briefly about the mineral needs. So lithium is often comes up, but it, that, it, the picture is more complex. You mentioned copper, of course. This graphic's a really nice one that you include in your slide. Um, talk, talk us through this and, and what we're looking at here. Yeah, so basically, you know, this is one way to look at it, and there's more than one way to look at it, and I think we will do this yeah. throughout, throughout <laughs> yeah. today, right? There's different kind of ways to cut this, but... You know, one is that the the technologies that are involved in renewable energy systems, right? So when we talk about renewable energy, it's actually, um, you know, we mean the sun and and wind energy, right? And we could debate, you know, does geothermal, does hydro count, et cetera. Um, But, but, you know, what this involves is harnessing renewable energy sources through physical infrastructures and technologies that, that can capture that energy, that can distribute it, that can deploy it, right? And all of that has a big physical build out and footprint, right? And also the supply chains for each of those in infrastructures and technologies, whether it's solar panels, wind turbines, lithium batteries, right? The bigger car, electric vehicle itself, which is more than just the battery. Um, all of them have supply chains that begin with mining, right? That's the first like step of the supply chain. And as we know, like, while we are very hopefully leaving fossil fuels in the ground in the near future, though not happening soon enough, right? Like that trend, sure. the transition yeah. is still very That's much- That's a whole series slow. of other episodes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. And so, you know, I, I hope that all the audience knows about that, that we need to leave those in the ground and also that that's not happening quickly enough a whole range of new extractive frontiers are are opening up because each of these technologies has these mineral inputs, right? And so what this is kind of showing is that is that there are like the mineral needs of our energy system are complexifying over time. Um, and lithium is one of those, and it's a particularly important one for a variety of reasons that we could get into. You know, one is that it it's essential for the transportation sector, which is a big contributor yeah. to global emissions and especially to U.S. emissions. In the U.S., our uh, transportation sector is 30% almost of our total emissions footprint. It's huge. It's 15% globally, right? So that gives yeah, you a sense. But the, the, U- the UK and the US are both similar. So the, yeah, the UK, yeah. it's 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 nearly 30%. It's 30%. The largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the UK is transport. Yeah. Exactly. And so that's because of all the car driving. That's yeah. why our, our transportation sectors are so emissions heavy, right? And so we need to transition away from that. But, you know, as you already said, Gareth, like there's many different energy transitions out there, right? Like, does it look like building out more rail? Does it look like more e-bikes? Does it look like more walkability? Or does it look like every individual household that can afford one having an electric vehicle, yeah. right? Those are very different <laughs> yeah. in a variety of ways, including in how much minerals they require. But 
However, we transition some, there will be some increase in mineral demand in these sectors that that furnish these different energy transition technologies. Yeah, it's interesting you talk about frontiers. So, so one of the things that, that comes up a lot when thinking about capitalism more broadly is the fact that it's always on the hunt for new frontiers. So, you know, obviously there are an enormous number of digital digital frontiers at the moment. AI is a frontier, like that's hugely overblown and overhyped, but it's a frontier because it's an opportunity for capital to kind of uh, recreate yep. itself. And it's interesting that that we're still in the 2000, you know, in, in, in the year 2023, which is the, the proper distant future at this point, you know, we're in the future, we're living it now. And um, we're still talking about mining as, as one of those incredibly primitive human, uh, you know, um, uh, forms of capitalism. And indeed, you know, kind of mining uh, precedes capitalism as a, as a form of extractivism. Anyway, so yeah, it's, it's interesting that, that we come back to some quite primitive themes of the way we function as humans. Um, so, those the extract we've talked about the the, the the different number of minerals and actually really we've talked about the fact that these minerals are going to increase so you, you, you've got the examples here of lithium graphite cobalt nickel and, and rare earths um and the growth in, yep. in expected in 2040 compared to kind of now as a baseline you know so lithium you're expecting 40 percent plus and actually i think later on in the research it it, it varies quite dramatically actually from that point but certainly yep. the baseline is we the, uh, as a business as usual, we need much more of this. And then you, there's the next graphic here, which is, comes from um, uh, it comes from a variety of sources. Really, again, it's looking at the varied demand based on different types of transport technology, yep. right? Um, yep. uh, actually, not just transport technology, sorry, but it shows that the that the majority of the demand is coming from this this light blue here, passenger electric vehicle demand. I'm circling Absolutely. it with my I'm John Maddening around it as we speak. Passenger electric vehicle demand is the is the lion's share of that, uh, and that's pretty scary actually. And it's a challenge, you know, it's a, it's 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 a challenge for 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 transport people. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. So I think we've talked about that. It's time for maps. Um, so at the moment. In fact, you know, you know what? Talk, talk us through this. So, talk us through yeah. what, what does it, what does the world look like in terms of lithium mines at the moment? Yeah. So, so you know, one of the reasons why on that prior slide lithium is projected to grow the most is that it's not a huge market currently. I mean, it's much smaller than than oil or even copper or whatever, but it's going to have to scale very dramatically because lithium batteries are seen as like the key technology to decarbonize the whole global auto sector, right? Which is a $3 trillion sector. Yeah. And if on top of that, we add mass transportation, which with electric buses, or if we yeah. add electric bikes, right? So it's 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 gonna scale rapidly, or that's, that's the idea. And so we're going from a situation where there's around 40 lithium mines in the world, and not all of those are battery lithium mines, mm. because, you know, we won't get into this, but for batteries, you need a very pure, like very technically like specific kind of form of lithium chemicals. And not every mine is good at producing that, right? Uh, so there's really okay. fewer than 40 in a way. Mm. And they're all in, in primarily in four places, right? So number one is Australia. That's the number one globally. Chile is number two. Um, and then Argentina or China and Argentina, or Ch Argentina and China. I'm blanking on the order there. But regardless, um, those are the four places. Yep. And that is going to change because of things that we will get into in more detail, but I, I'll just preview a little now, yeah. which is that both governments and corporations are really pushing to expand mining in these places. So there'll be new mines in some of these places and those are already you know, ramping up and then in lots of other places, right? And we'll get to that a little bit later, but what we mean is like, um, you know, 150%, 200%, like, incre I mean, this is a big increase, right? Yeah, so yeah. we have 40 now, and we need an additional new one. So that those are new additional, not like, not like including the 40. Yeah, right? yeah. So that's like <laughs> an enormous, yeah, 200%. It's an enormous increase in, 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 in right. the, in, in the level of extraction. Yeah. And why, and why is there that range A very, you know, a detail oriented mm. listener might ask why <laughs> yes. that's like a big range. The reason for that range is we don't know quite yet how much recycling will ramp up because okay. batteries are recyclable and you can actually technically recover like 95% mm. of the minerals in them. Um, but we, we're not there where we need to be with recycling infrastructure or capacity. So a lot hinges on that. If we recycle a lot, we might just need 59 mines, you know, according to Benchmark Minerals, yeah, the source yeah. of this. You get the idea. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But it just gives an idea of that scale. And as you say, exactly. we'll, we'll touch on this again momentarily. And so, yeah, this this... So there's, there's a few extracts from the news here, and I suppose this is you're using this to make the point about. Um, I mean, you know, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I suppose this is talking about the, the the idea of supply and demand in relation to the to, to, exactly. to these minerals, but it's not the full picture. So yeah, I mean, I mean, it's not the full picture really. 
you know, it can, I, I, I extracted this, the text here really kind of, because it was a really interesting point that yeah. it cannot be viewed, this whole, the whole picture here cannot be viewed simply through the, the lens of supply and demand. It's, it's yeah. much more complicated than that, right? And exactly. so you frame it as a, as a load of questions that are, that are really key to understand. Yep. Yep. So what I'm trying to get at here is that there's a lot of political and maybe even more broadly like social decisions that are going to be made across these supply chains, right? You know, there's a whole set of questions of like, how are communities going to react to these new mines, right? Will they be built? Will they be protested against? Will they move forward? We'll talk about protests later, yeah. you know, in this in this hour. Um, you know, there's others like where are the in-between nodes going to be built, like all the, mm. the chemical refining, yep. you know, the, the vehicle manufacturing. And then, you know, who's going to benefit from that? Like, are we looking at, you know, end use consumers primarily in the global north and also China, of course, uh, where most of the EV consumption is going to happen? And who's paying the cost, whether we think in terms of like environmental costs, social costs or the labor exploitation across the whole supply chain? Yep. And like, are there ways to make this all you know, more more equitable. And so while I think supply and demand are important, right, they actually don't don't show us how thoroughly political all of this. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and we know that it's political, and this is very relevant to the UK and the Labour Party sort of like ongoing new kind of like policy platforms that yeah. are being released. But, you know, there's a lot of green industrial policy happening. Yep. And, and governments are getting very involved in the energy transition. I don't think that's a bad thing, right? I'm in favor no, no, of governments yeah, yeah. getting involved, but but that means that there's politics on the table, but and it also means that there's like real power imbalances between you know who's going to kind of get their vision pushed through. Yeah, and, um, and, and so we'll talk about that. Yeah, and, and it's in, in lots of ways. It's it's to what extent that it's like externalities and incentives, right? So you've got all these, you've got this existing multi-trillion-dollar industry. That yep. clearly the incentive is enormous for them and the and the governments who don't necessarily want to scare them off to kind of keep things how they are, which we know isn't yeah. a good thing for all sorts of reasons. Car de dependence is crippling for all sorts of reasons in the in the US, particularly you know with with the entire country really having been built to be entirely car dependent. Lots of problems with that, and the externalities related to that don't just relate to mineral extraction, but all the other stuff, all these questions that it's quite difficult to split apart the, 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 the extractivism and the bigger picture stuff about what kind of society we really want to have exactly. in the future. All, right? The two ends of the supply chain are connected, yeah, uh, yeah. in other words. And so, well, it's it's almost more of a circle or like ideally we should think about it that way. Like, yeah, yeah. They, there's, there's a lot of just causality that goes in both directions and and that hopefully will be clear by the end of today if it's not already <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah so um in within you kind of talk about three groups three groups right. where which i suppose is where power is focused if you like exactly. obviously the picture is always more complex but three quite you know quite distinct groups so you have governments yeah. and you refer to the kind of actions that government or you know correct me if i'm wrong on this but i think you refer to the way that governments behave and the actions that governments can take as green statecraft yep um you have companies or firms as you as you put in presentation and that's kind of the green capitalism and, and yep. they're incentivized to essentially keep doing what they're doing or at least just a like for like replacement of what they're doing they don't want change they want Want, uh, right. nothing to change and then a tiny little dot here um is is social movements is actual people oh my goodness people are represented here and it's this and, and again green extractivism is, is, is such a really neat i like it a lot as a phrase but it's the resistance to that it's the resistance yep. to, to this movement to continue extraction um under the label of being green and so yeah let, let's let, let's kind of break through these and start with with kind of governments and i don't know if you want kind of yeah i, I don't know if you want to talk about governments first and then maybe talk about the security sustainability nexus so maybe well, let's talk about governments briefly right first okay let's do it yeah yeah go for it. Compress things. I think it'll it'll come out more concretely this way. Mm. Uh, these words may or may not mean anything right away, but <laughs> I'll explain. You know what I'm getting at, which is like the, we're going to sort of go to the global north now, right? So we started in Chile, which is one key place where these lithium frontiers are, um, and and we'll sort of go back to, to South America maybe at the end of this when we look at protests. But we're going to go to the powerful countries in the world, so called, like the powerful governments of the U.S., the EU, the U.K., China, et cetera, right? And like, what are they doing right now with these supply chains? And I don't think this will come as any surprise because it's been really uh, front and center in the news that governments, first of all, since the pandemic began, have been thinking much more about supply chains yep. as yeah. as vulnerable, as not always producing what's needed when it's needed, but but more geopolitically as like as important to national security, right? And there's this whole kind of competition thing happening of like who controls which supply chains, who dominates, who can build them out faster. 
And I guess it also almost goes without saying that the Chinese government for a long time, for decades, has prioritized electric mobility in particular, along with some other energy transition sectors like, you know, solar panel production, et cetera. And, you know, from the perspective of the UK government or US or European, they're like ahead, right? Yep. And so we need to like catch up. And so how do we do this, right? And so, so what's new is that supply chains, especially for energy transition, are being thought of in terms of national security. Another new thing, and this gets to the second part of the phrase, is like the sustainability thing, which is that, again, maybe familiar to listeners, but we all we hear two things from our governments in the global north. One is that it's important to national security to build these supply chains at home. We can't rely on China, supposedly, or other places on Earth. It's also, we're told, more responsible, sustainable, better regulations, mm -hmm. better governance if we have like the lithium mining in the US or in the UK where there are lithium mining projects mm. underway, right? Or Europe, right? And so it, it'll, it'll improve the environmental kind of and social standards if we do it closer to home. And I think we should question both of these. I'm not, I'm not actually saying let's throw them out or say they're, they're dumb arguments, but we should absolutely be critical and say, why is it national, why is national security involved here? And also, is it automatically more sustainable to do the mining in one place versus another, right? So we should just think critically about these claims, but they're being really um, deployed by governments right now. And the end result of this, and this circles back to something you already said, Gareth, is that a lot of money, public money, I want to say, yeah. like taxpayer money and other forms of you know public you know, public financing, are being leveraged to support companies across these supply chains with the goal of them setting up shop within US borders, within Canadian borders, within EU borders, right? And so it's not just you know saying, oh, it'd be great to have these supply chains at home, nor is it saying, for the most part, we should have public ownership of parts of these supply yeah. <laughs> chains. Instead, it's like kind of neoliberal or corporate friendly industrial policy, which is a lot of wonky terms. But you know what that means in, in, in simpler language is that yes, states and governments are getting involved in making sure that these economic industries from mining to battery manufacturing are, are kind of setting up shop within their borders, but they're doing so by throwing a lot of very sweet incentives yeah. at companies it's like, you know, free or low cost loans, yeah. subsidies, um, uh, deregulation or fast tracking of permitting, like all sorts of stuff that we're familiar with. It's, it's the classic, it's yeah, it's the classic, it's, it's that classic phrase of that, you know, it's nationalizing the risk and then privatizing the, the, the kind of the benefits and the profit. It's the, it's right. the classic neoliberal model where the, the state takes on the risk and the really, the right. messy stuff. And right. then the, the, the corporate entities then, and I suppose we'll talk about this corporate government relationship momentarily, and the, the, the corporates kind of then take that take that benefit. Um, yeah, so so let, let's jump back to our map of the world again. Yeah. Um, so we know that there's there's around 40 lithium extracting uh, kind of facilities. Mm -hmm. So then we talk about the fact that we've got the, you talk about the future global north extractors. So, so you've already touched on this, is the idea that we're, we're insourcing some of this, some of this, exactly. these mining res, uh, kind of uh, mining facilities. Yeah. So, so yeah. So very briefly, we've got we've got the U.S., we've got Spain, Portugal, uh, Germany, the U.K., and Serbia as well in there. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Shout out to Serbia. So yeah. So that's the so, so very briefly talk about why is it happening here? You know, in the U.S., there's an enormous concentration. I think you said mostly in North Carolina, right? I, 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 like a huge concentration in in in, in, yeah, I'll, in the Midwest. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll explain. So it's 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 really interesting because this is a big deal, right? So. You know, we have to kind of hold two things in our heads at once, or three or four. Like, and, and it's going to feel a little contradictory, but it's all true, and sometimes reality is contradictory. Like, the one thing is that you know we're going to continue to have lots of mining in the blue places and the places where mining is already happening. Yeah. We'll also, and we'll talk about this in a moment, have new mining in the global south. And yeah. so overall, we're going to sort of continue to have. And thanks. Yeah, you can put up the green. Now. Yeah, let's It'll put them all up there. Yeah, yeah. Like. Overall, like resources flow from south to north in the global economy, right? Resources, raw materials, human labor, energy, all of those things, right? So we're not changing that, but we are like kind of mutating it or putting a little twist on it, which is that more and more of this mining will also simultaneously mm -hmm. be happening within the global north because of this whole national security idea of we need the supply chains at home and we need to create jobs at home and the whole thing, right? 
And so all of these things are happening at once because we have a planetary mine. You know, we have a mine, you know, a sort of mining infrastructure that's planetary in scope. We have increasing demand, as we've already said. And to serve that demand, like lots of mines can be opening in lots of places, plus mines take a long time to build. So yeah. while these new mines are being built, like the current places are ramping up to meet the global demand, right? So it's like all of this is happening at once. And so just to make it super concrete, I'll just talk about the US. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, though, though all of these red places and green places are, are happening. Um, in the US, in the Western part of the US, so good placement of the arrow, in the Western part of the US, where a lot of the known lithium reserves are, there's also some in the Eastern US, but I'll, I'll just ignore that for now. In the Western US, we have over 100 mining projects proposed. Now, a lot of those won't make it. Anyone that knows anything about the mining industry knows it's very speculative, excuse me, speculative. Like it's like a lot gets proposed and only a subset happen and also things get merged. So two small projects become a big project, right? But the point is it's a lot of mines being proposed, yeah. right? And 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 so that that's in like California, Nevada, uh, Arizona, Colorado, all these western states, right? Okay, and that's yeah. not counting the North Carolina, the the Arkansas, you know, there's other states elsewhere in the country. So this is a big deal and and what's happening is that these companies are responding to not just market signals, right? So this is where we get back to that theme of it's not just supply and demand. They're not just responding to market signals. Those market signals existed for a little while already. They're not so new that we're gonna electrify transportation and this mining is gonna increase. What's really new is the policy signals, which is you will have financial backstopping, you will have a subsidy, you will have a loan, or like a government agency will do your R&D for you so that you know that the technology works, right? So there's just a lot more government backstopping and sort of guarantees and subsidies and that is making that that's changing projects from being potential projects to being more profitable projects right that's what that that government financing makes the difference with whether something is truly profitable or not and so you know again not i'm very much in favor of government involvement and broader democratic involvement in these energy transition you know infrastructures and decisions but but the question is like you know again who's benefiting what kind yeah, of yeah transition is being prioritized. And what we see right now is a big emphasis on building out this extraction with a lot of benefits to, to companies. Uh, uh, you know, historically, we've always had the situation where extraction is always at the expense of the, of the, of the, of the population. You know, whether it's an indigenous population, whether it's the working population, the, the people who actually either, either suffer their land being taken or do the physical labor, often right. those are the same people, particularly in the global south. Um, they don't see any of the benefits. And, and, and really, we need to be unless we just want to just have another century of business as usual, we need to be, uh, uh, and, you know, countries like the US, the UK need to be leading with the message of, of right. I mean, they obviously will not, but we would like them to lead on the message of actually, maybe let's do something different and actually perhaps think about a future where um, the the benefits are not just centralized to a very small number of people right. um, I, in the global I, north. And I want to just interject quickly because that's a very good point and I, I want to just like add one mm. thing to it. Um, that's another just food for thought. I won't like sort of resolve this complicated issue, but I <laughs> yeah. want to put it on the table, which is that one might say what you just said and then say, well, therefore it's more just for more mining to happen in the global north. And I think that there is an argument there, right? Like mm. I'm not dismissive of that because I think it's absolutely true that the current map of extraction, and we're just looking at lithium, but we could add in tons yeah, of other yeah. extractive sectors and take a look at the map. Um, the current map of extraction is unjust, both because it's concentrated in specific places that bear or the brunt of the, the environmental harm and labor exploitation, but also because the end use products are very unequally distributed, yeah. very unequally distributed, not just EVs, but any end use product of this mining. So that is unjust. And so it might seem more just to like, let's bring the mining to the places where the end use products are being used. That feels more just. And I think that there is a logic to that. The little complication though, is if we zoom in and we yeah, will like, a little later yeah. to like where precisely yeah. the mining is happening in the US, <laughs> It still is complicated because it's not the Tesla owners that have the mines in their backyard. Yeah. I'll put it that way. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, and, and that's true in the UK. It's true in Portugal. It's true. Yeah, as we say, we'll get there. So we'll get there. Okay. That, was, that was governments. That's green straight caft. Let's let's talk very briefly about uh, companies and green capitalism. I mean, we've kind of touched on a lot of these themes already, yeah, but yeah, let's. I, I'm being cheeky and throwing Tesla, but actually, Tesla's really a small player in this. It's it's the GMs, the Fords, the the kind of the really big players that have like two or three orders of magnitude more lithium, you know, more mineral consumption than Tesla. But I've put Tesla up because, you know, 
uh, it's fun to make fun of uh, Elon Musk. So uh, let's go. Yeah, let's talk about about the the, the corporates, the companies, the firms, and, and where they sit as power. Tesla, I'll, I'll just use that as a pivot. Tesla is important, though it's not the same size as our big auto companies. It is, you know, very important in electric vehicles, and we'll see how long that lasts because mm. now they're getting they're facing real competition from, of course, Chinese electric vehicle yep. companies, but also the like traditional Western ones, now that they're electrifying their fleets, you know, we'll see how Tesla does in competition with more and more firms, right? Yeah. But Tesla's important because it, it, it's sort of, it, at least on in the Western, in this US kind of side, China has a different trajectory here with its own domestic EV manufacturers and everything. But regardless, in the US, like Tesla really is like our first main like EV company. Yeah. And, you know, some of the things that they're doing indicate where the industry is going. And, you know, one thing that they're doing kind of in an interesting way in parallel to all of this government securitization of supply chains, like putting a lot of emphasis on national security and we need this stuff at home, is that companies are also not trusting global trade and markets as much as they used to, to get what they need, right? And so what we see is that EV companies, whether it's Tesla or whether it's like the big auto companies like GM, BMW, Ford, um, uh, all of these others, um, they're starting to directly invest in lithium mining, right? So they're kind of going back to what we might call Fordism, Right, yeah, where yeah. you would actually vertically integrate everything, yeah. steel, you know, everything that was needed. Um, and then globalization and neoliberalism kind of changed that and reconfigured it and with these very global supply chains. Now we're kind of returning, you know, it's not that the future is like history exactly, but just to use a metaphor, like we're kind of returning to this other model where the end use companies, the, the buyers of all these minerals are not trusting that they can just get them whenever they want through, you know, just through normal sort of free market or trade mechanisms. They don't think there's going to be enough. They see themselves in real competition with one another. So yeah, they're yeah. trying to directly invest in the mines. And they're doing that in a variety of ways through joint ventures, you know, through helping to finance mines. And it's very interesting. So it's kind of parallel things on the green capitalist and, and green statecraft. And they're connected to one another also as well. Um, but, you know, one other point I'll make about green capitalism and just to sort of emphasize is that firms at both ends of the supply chain, both the lithium miners, um, the mining companies um, uh, that, you know, some of which you've already mentioned, like Albemarle and and, um, uh, and SQM, but there's lots of other lithium mining companies and some of the big mining conglomerates are moving into lithium as well. Um, and then on the other end of the supply chain, the automakers, both of those sets of companies benefit from these government incentives, which basically expand the supply of these minerals, which the auto companies, of course, need. And then the mining companies, it directly helps finance their, their operations, right? And they also benefit, I will say, by this government rhetoric that, like, it's more sustainable to do it in the U.S. or Europe, yeah. because all these companies like, you know, reputational, uh, you know, sort of positive reputational capital, right? And so yeah, yeah, yeah. if they open a mine in the U.S. or they source from a mine in the U.S., if they're an auto company, and they say, therefore, it's more responsible, also it helps U.S., national security, like, you know, what's good for GM is good for America, like yeah, that sort yeah. of thing. And so it's very interesting. You know, I don't I want to disentangle capitalism and the state because I don't think they're like the same. But it's very interesting how they're coordinating, how there's some mutual benefits and and, you know, and we can see kind of how these elite alliances are taking hold. Absolutely. Yeah. The state sponsored capitalism thing is, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, we've, we've infinite episodes of, of other better podcasts than mine who talk about that inter that interrelationship for sure but yeah it's um it, it's it, it's impossible to separate the two it's, it's not that the two are separate acting separately there is that complete intrinsic link and i suppose that we've kind of touched on that so I, you know i, I, I created yeah. some nice slides to kind of make that point but I, th I think we've kind of pointed out that that relationship of the statecraft and and, and capitalism they they're it, it's not as simple as, as you say. It's not just as simple as the governments are entirely in cahoots, because as we've seen with with recent U.S. kind of policy announcements and industrial strategy announcements, there is a bit more of a moving towards a little bit more state management Absolutely. industrial and, strategy. And Things are changing in, a little bit. In labor's, you know, and I'm yeah, and the I, you in know, green industrial revolution type stuff. Like internal labor yeah, politics. No, it's which messy. I'm sure your your, uh, <laughs> your viewers have different thoughts on, but I will say that at least according to the news I read, like there's a little bit more boldness than we might expect from someone like your Starmer, like <laughs> uh, in terms of like, we're yeah. gonna do something state let, you know, whatever, we'll see what yeah, actually yeah, yeah. happens. But but point being, this is being discussed, right? I do wanna note one just counterpoint here, mm. and then we can move on to, to, to sort of the grassroots movements, um, which is that, 
you know, another reason it's important to disentangle is is not just to be accurate about, you know, how these the relationship works and how the benefits kind of flow, but also to note that there can be tension points and there mm. are tension points. Like one of them, and it's a very obvious one, so I'll just I'll just stick with this example, is that not every company wants to like relocate its supply chain yeah. to within the US or Europe, right? Like they have been very used to these globalized supply chains to working with China uh, in China very closely, you know, and, and it's complicated for them um, to kind of disentangle their supply chains or so-called like decouple, right? Yeah. And, and we get this interesting shift from a variety of EU, UK and US leaders saying, oh, we don't wanna decouple, we wanna de-risk. I mean, like all this language is being thrown around because it's actually complicated to like undo globalization or to undo China's hugely important yeah, role yeah, in the global yeah. economy. And so that's a tension point that we'll see how it works out, but it's mitigated by all of these sweet financial incentives that not fully mitigated, but sort of offset by them. And you get all sorts of other sort of like layers of jelly within our enormous kind of complicated cake picture, if I'm going to use a weird analogy. Like, the, you know, the the, the, the the relationship with, with organized labor, of course, is if you're bringing things to countries with where there is less ability to exploit the workforce or at least exploit them in different ways, that complicates things and is, is a disincentive to these corporate organizations. Yeah, all these things, all these compl complex things, Things. And and it's yeah, there's there are multiple academic careers, as you know yourself, in, in unpicking even even just shining a very dimmed or like even just shining a torch in amongst it all is 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 a very kind of labor intensive uh, academic uh, <laughs> academic job. So the last one, we've got the governments, the companies, and and it's not entirely true that these are in opposition to each other, but they're 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 different points of power and and the, the relationship yeah. and and yeah, so social movements, the, the kind of where you can imagine a, a much smaller source of power, but not to be ignored. Certainly, no, it's not something that can be ignored, have, as, as we'll talk about, can be powerful. Um, Absolutely. And indeed, I jumped straight to a picture. Um, it's interesting for a number of reasons. Firstly, that Nikola Tesla, uh, who should never have allowed his name to be, or the estate should never have allowed his name to go to Musk. But anyway, it wasn't his company to start with, um, is Serbian. So it's interesting that we jumped to a picture of, um, or was Serbian, uh, jumped to a picture of a, of a protest in, in Belgrade here. Um, Izdaya means uh, betrayal and Lopovi means um, thieves. So yeah, that gives an idea of the sentiment of the group here. And the the... the so this is that picture was taken from a similar uh, kind of the same day or around the protests happening here in 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 Serbia about um, new lithium mines Rio yep. Tinto right were were opening and indeed had their license revoked so there is power in these movements and I have to say in Serbia for that to happen it's quite remarkable for for that to happen given Vucic and and the state of politics in Serbia so. Yeah. Let, let's yeah. talk a bit about yeah. We, we've got a few of these these pictures up, and this it's worth saying that a few of these, um, particularly you know in the U.S. here, but not only in the U.S. You know there are multiple indigenous populations involved in this grassroots movement. So let's yeah, yeah. Thea, let's have a talk about this um, and so grassroots movement. I'm glad you started with with Serbia, um, both because it, it was a very interesting movement. I will not go beyond my expertise. I haven't done field work in Serbia, but it became you know as you can see from the photographs, like or from the one you showed and the one that that's that that I have here, like that it became a movement that went beyond the immediate places where extraction was going to take place and was in like major cities, and it just became a mass movement of discontent with the government, but really like centered and triggered by this huge contract with a with a re with a big multinational mining company Rio Tinto, right? In a yeah. place where there's already a lot very high levels of pollution, maybe among the highest in Europe and oh, a yeah. lot of environmental degradation, right? <laughs> yeah, and so, big time. you know, what that shows is is a couple of things that I want to point out. Um so it's a, again a good example to start with. First that like oftentimes especially in more successful meaning ones that have more impact, anti-mining or anti-extractive movements, a lot of issues come together, right? Mm -hmm. There are social issues about like, is the village gonna have to be moved, right? Or did they get the villagers consent or not, right? There's environmental issues of the use of water, like we talked about earlier, or contamination of water, uh, or destruction of habitat, right? Um, there are political issues, like what was the relationship between the government and the firm, and was it a fair contract, yeah. and is the revenue going to be distributed to the local community, right? So, uh, and labor exploitation, right? And mining, it has a long history of, of very exploitative labor relations and also very militant unions. Not my focus, but one that has hmm. lots of history books written on it and is very interesting, right? And so the point is they condense a lot about the inequality of capitalism about global inequalities and like who gets what, right? And also about like the relationship between capitalism and nature and environment, mm -hmm. right? And so it just can become a real powder keg of a lot of different grievances. So that's one thing. 
The second thing to note, you said the contract was revoked, which is true, or the license, I think, yeah. or something. Anyway, um, and so that can happen, and it increasingly does happen. And so at any mining industry conference you go to, there's more over the years, and I've been to them for like over a decade, like in, you know, over different parts of my research, more and more focus is on like, how do we get the quote, social license, an industry term that I don't use <laughs> yeah, analytically, yeah. but it's very a very revealing mm -hmm. term, the social license to operate, because they know that they, they, they see it in their own, you know, firsthand experience, and the academic research also bears it out, that more and more communities are resisting mining projects, and also they're doing so more militantly, right? Like their resistance doesn't, you know, always take the form of like, let's renegotiate. It's like, we don't want this at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and sometimes they end up renegotiating, right? Sometimes it can go there. But as anyone that knows anything about either strikes or protests knows, it's good to take a militant position first, yeah. even if you end up <laughs> negotiating, right? Yeah. And so what, what you have is a picture that mining companies, when they, they set foot in new communities, and those can be in the global south or the global north, they are more likely to encounter pushback, criticism, protest, procedural and legal actions, which are now like costed in to the price of doing business because they're so frequent. And so even though the the ball, you know, the little circle was small yeah. when we looked at governments, um, capitalism and movements, like they are, these movements are at key choke points mm. of the global economy. Like if the resources don't come out of the ground, like the other stuff doesn't get built, right? And so they have leverage and they are using it and they're much more environmentally conscious and also like transnationally networked, the communities I mean. So they're, they, they are like sort of using, they're more savvy. They're like using tactics that are really effective. They know the law and the legal landscape really well. They know their rights. Um, and so it's, it's really interesting that, you know, we have this basically a couple decades now of increasing militancy of communities at these extractive frontiers of the global economy coinciding. So that's one trajectory, like coinciding with a bunch of new extractive frontiers yeah. that are being <laughs> yeah. up, right? So you yeah. get the idea of conflict is going to potentially proliferate. And it's interesting. I mean, I mean, we should take great heart in seeing how effective the opposition to these things can be. We should be re Sometimes it can feel a bit, you know, as, as, as anyone left, it can feel pretty bleak because we're just losing everywhere. <laughs> it just feel it can feel like that, right? But actually, we should take great heart in the success of these movements internationally, the connectivity of these movements internationally. You know, we should take great heart in this. Uh, and, and, right. and in that combination of activism, of, of legal activism, so this combination right the way across different walks of life, different experiences, Kind of combining to to to, to do good and to uh, and to kind of protect yeah. uh, populations, environments. It, it's it's really it's it's really heartening. And, and so is, yeah. And, and one other thing, and this we can go to the next slides because yeah is yeah yeah. So, you know, brings us forward, which is the other thing to notice is that, um, and you can maybe go to the next one. Yeah, sure. Some more photographs. Yeah, like the other thing to notice. So this is in Portugal. Um, is that like these are all over the world because of that expanding map that we talked yeah, about, yeah. right? So it's in the global south, it's in the global north, right? It's in Chile, it's in Nevada in the United States, right? It's in Portugal, it's in Spain, it's in Serbia. And so, and that's interesting because these movements, uh, like the networks that these different movements kind of are part of and, and, and pay attention to are transnational and they cut across this big divide of global north and south, right? Which I think, you know, it's, it's interesting to see this kind of transnational network from below that is contesting this big vision of like how we're going to transition yeah. the, 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 um, the energy sector, right? And so it, it's not like we only get protests in the global south or we only get in the global north. In fact, like we're seeing very similar what we can call repertoires of protest across, you know, these kind of, you know, the big chasm of, of, of like geographic difference in, in, yeah. in the world. Um, and these communities sometimes feel like they have more in common with one another than with like the countries that they're in. And what yeah, I mean by yeah. that is like, you know, if I, there, and on a prior slide and maybe on a subsequent one, there, there's like a, there's pictures of, of Nevada. And so Nevada is in the Southwest of the US. There's indigenous communities, indigenous reservations there. And those are the people being impacted by these mines. And, you know, I've seen on, on international convenings, them talk to indigenous communities in South America. Yeah, yeah. And like the fact that, you know, one of them is in the US and the others in South America, like, indigenous communities are very marginalized within the West, right? Like within the global North, right? So they they feel like there's a sort of commonality despite the fact that like, oh, we're in the most powerful country and affluent country in the world, but we don't experience that, right? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Because we're yeah, yeah. marginalized. So there are these interesting similarities between the types of places and communities affected, whether they're indigenous, whether they're kind of 
farmer or or place based, meaning they're people whose livelihoods are connected to the land. Yep. And that's the case in Portugal, even though they're not indigenous, they are farmers, right? Mm -hmm. And so they need the water, they need the clean soil, right? And so, you know, you get these similarities of where extractive frontiers kind of tend to, uh, to kind of expand to. Yeah. I mean, again, there's a we, we could talk for hours about the about the kind of the class relationship and the and the kind of the the social implications of that. Um, but we, I mean, you know, maybe someday in the future. But we, I think, maybe, to be honest, reading your work, reading the work of lots of people, reading the words of the activists. You know, there's lots of, of of accounts online of the of these groups themselves talking about what they've done, talking about the struggles that they've they've gone through. Um, yeah. so kind of okay, right? The the the. the I, the reason we, by the way, left the last five, ten minutes to talk about the transport stuff is because the reality is it's not the most important bit of the discussion. I think the stuff we've just talked about is the really important stuff. That's the key context, even though the data and the fiddly stuff is what we're now going to talk about. So it's, yeah. it's about moving beyond green, what you what you kind of term as green capitalism. And I think everyone kind of kind of kind of see in the discussion we've had what we mean by that. So, so we've already t we've already had this this uh, yeah. this graphic up, uh, and then I've I've nicked this from from the Guardian article, which which um, there's a really nice Guardian article that captures. I mean, boo to the, the Guardian, but the, you know they they are still doing some very nice data led uh, journalism, even if they employed far too many turfs. But the um, this gra there's some really nice graphics in your piece. It's a really good piece uh, explaining kind of basically covering kind of what we talked about. Right. Um, but focused more on the transport side. So if people want the the really interesting detail in the in the transport dig into that for sure and also in some of the other talks that, that Thea's given. So we've kind of talked about this stuff. We we talked about this big picture already. But what does this mean so so the what 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 should the future look like? And this is kind of interesting because you've done the you've you've kind of done a lot of work to explore what this future might look like. So talk talk very briefly about about the the the, the research work with with the climate and community yep. project and the yep. scenarios and, and the approach here. Yeah, so um, so just to, to explain what motivated all of this, and, and I think this will help, especially for those of you, though there's probably many transportation technically savvy people in the audience, but just for those of you that aren't, I'm just gonna give you this sort of big picture like research question that motivated this, which is, is there a way to get to zero emissions transportation, which we 100% and I 100% like, yep. you know, think that is necessary yesterday. I mean, we've, we've already delayed actually this quite a bit. Uh, it's been obvious that we need to do this for a long time. And so is there a way to get to zero emissions with less mining than those very alarming forecasts that we just looked at and we looked at, at the beginning of the talk, right? And so I don't say no mining because in the near term, there will be some more mining regardless of which path we go down, but there's a big difference between which path we take to the end goal of zero emissions, yeah. right? And so we outlined four. I won't get into each of them. You can read them while I'm talking yeah. if you can multitask. It's but, kind of like a business you know, as usual. Scenario one's like yeah. business as usual. So scenario, scenario four, is, is, yeah. Is business as usual electrified, you know? To, to yes, just, to just, yeah. You know, we're gonna replace every e, every ICE vehicle with an EV, every internal combustion engine vehicle with an EV, and, and more than that because growth, population and demand growth over time. So, you know, a lot of EVs get produced basically. Yeah. And we change nothing else. And just to note, and I won't go up, I'll just do kind of yeah, one yeah, yeah. and four. And, and two and three are gradients in between. But, you know, one is like electrified status quo. So that means in the US, and it's all US transportation yeah. sector based, just for what it's worth, but we could apply this and we are actually applying this to some other mm. countries and, and you could do it anywhere. But, you know, one is like same kind of rates of car ownership, same patterns of, of transportation mode, meaning people drive more than they do other things um, in terms of their mode choices. Um, same sprawl, right? Uh, our US yep. is terrible suburban and exurban sprawl. Same, by the way, like size of batteries, right? We'll get into that maybe mm. if we have a moment because the battery size of the vehicle yeah. really matters. And so everything stays the same except we electrify it. And we assume renewable energy so that we're getting to zero emissions, right? So that's scenario one. Scenario four is like a totally different future, but not like a totally utopian one, meaning it's like a doable future, but it's a very different future. So in that future, we increase the mode shares of yeah. non-car transportation, right? So that can look like rail, it can look like bus, it can uh, look like um, uh, cycling, it can look like you know active transportation, cycling and walking, right? So we really shift away from car use. They're not zero cars, still many EVs yeah. are used here. One critical reason for that that I wanna point out because it also applies to the UK is we don't touch rural areas, meaning in our modeling, we just say like rural people are going to drive, right? Like, we're not going to tackle that issue. And that's yeah. what I mean that there's a certain realistic. It's quite a reasonable, it, right? real, exactly. It's a reasonable assumption to make. And if you do better than that, great. But it's a re right. it's a realistic exactly. assumption. Yeah. And there are, by the way, cool ideas and actual policy experiments with reducing car dependency in rural areas. It can be done. 
Yeah. But we're just going to say we're not going to tackle that right now. We're going to try to make metropolitan regions, so the the um, uh, the cities, the the first ring suburbs, the suburbs, the exurbs, that whole kind of thing. We're going to try to make them denser. We're going to decrease car using, like the mode share, but also like the vehicle ownership rates, yeah. right? And we're going to um, also experiment with more recycling of batteries, smaller batteries, the whole thing. So we have like this big spread. And those are, and we'll maybe move on to a yes. next slide. Yeah, this is like, kind of neatly laid out know, here. Um, we can skip this. I kind of already said. Oh, okay, um, right, nice. You know, we're going to get really big differences. Okay, so this is the the, the key thing. We'll, we'll have just like a couple of, of results slides, meaning like our, yeah, our, yeah. our findings of doing these different models, which, doing these different pathways, which, by the way, no one had done. Mm. Like, this all started because I was doing research in Chile, just like we started, you know, our presentation today. And I was like, huh, I wonder if anyone's figured out if, like, yeah. you used fewer cars. And it turned out, like, no one had done that research, which was actually mind-boggling to me. That was in 2019. Each year, I would, like, do a Google Scholar search. And, yeah, like, well, no one had done surely it. someone, so finally, you know, all the did. policy being announced, surely someone's done the work, right? Yeah. Right. But it just gives a sense of how, like, the blinders of car dependency yeah. and the just sort of questions that are being asked, you know, are, are very constrained. Okay, so now we have our results we get huge differences. And so this is in cumulative demand. It gets even more dramatic in another slide that we'll look at when we just look at 2050 demand. But for now, we'll stay with cumulative. That's from now to 2050. We could get a 66% reduction, huge yeah. reduction, you know, more than half reduction it, between scenarios one and four, right? Um, and we get significant reduction even if in the in-between scenarios, right? Like yeah, yeah. slightly reduce car dependency or slightly reduce sprawl. These are important because each of those is like one fewer mine that needs to yeah, be built, yeah. right? So just like think about it in those ways, right? And we also, by the way, get big reductions, and this is the second bullet point, not changing anything about car ownership or use, which both, ah. you know, Gareth and I want to change. But let's yeah, just yeah. say we're not going to change that. We're going to give up. Americans are too car dependent. <laughs> yeah. But maybe we could make our batteries more normal sized. And the reason I say more normal sized and not smaller, I know the tech says smaller, but I don't even want to say small because that's like kind of giving a bone to the car industry. Because in the US, our EV batteries are twice the size of global average. And is also, that just because of vehicle twice, size? Is, yeah. yeah. Insane. And, and, and they're also twice the size of like seven years ago or something. So they've just gotten, they've ballooned in size. And we could ask why that is. It's because just in short, electric SUVs, just like gas guzzling yeah. SUVs are much more profitable for the auto industry. Anyways, yeah, yeah, yeah. so, you know, maybe we could just make our batteries more normal size, like the Western European size or the East Asian size. Then we get an almost 30% reduction yeah. without changing car use. This is incredible, actually. That's an incredible number, really. Like yeah. you get half the scenario for reduction just from normal battery size. And yes, that's incredible. Yeah. So um, anyway, so then we get the, you know, on the other side, we'll increase if we, so, okay. So yeah, we can yeah. go to another, another slide, but this gives yeah. you a sense. And this is, this is what I wanted to get to actually the second, um, the second bullet point. So just try to bear with me on the second bullet point and I'll explain what it says. Mm. So what what we did was just look at the year 2050, which is the last year that we modeled in our modeling, right? And so everything else I've said is cumulative across yeah. all those years. This is just a, a one year snapshot of the last year. And the spread between our best and worst case scenarios. So the worst case is like the worst version of scenario one and the best <laughs> case is the best version because actually each of those have like dozens of decision points within them. So the worst case is our batteries get even larger, right? Mm. We, we like have even more car use, right? It's like worse in terms of everything but electrified. And our best case is like, we, we do everything, we do like perfect recycling, we have smaller batteries, you know, everything is, is like our, you know, eco-socialist utopia. Okay, so yeah. best and worst case, the difference between those for 2050 demand of lithium is 92%. <sighs> so that's huge. Yeah. And I want to just explain for any modeling or number nerds, yes. like why is it, why do we get such a bigger difference, a bigger spread in 2050 than we do cumulatively? The reason, and this is because it's important to point out, mm. and it's an interesting fact, is like it, a lot of it has to do with recycling being a better and more viable source of substitution over time. In our first year of our model, we don't have a lot of recycling feedstock yeah, to work with. We need the cars to reach the end of their life so that the batteries can enter the recycling system. Mm. And by 2050, there's much more recycling feedstock. So you've got and a so much, get, so you've got a loop with a lot more stuff more going circular, around in the circle. Not perfectly circular because there's still new mining. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're a much more circular economy than mm. we have, um, you know, earlier on, even with our best case, you know, approaches. That's it's such. I mean, it's just, it's a, an impressive number, and it just shows how much. If nothing else, it shows how much 
thought needs to go into this policy. It cannot just be charge ahead with, right, we're just going to replace Light for Light. It just, yeah. There's so much to be gained, particularly if you think Onion of Doom, and you think, let's do as much of this as quickly as possible. There's so much to be gained by thinking long-term, thinking about yes. the benefits of, of a, of and, a, of and a just, just transition. I'm just going to slide in this last point yeah. as it relates to what you just said, and I know we're near the hour, but, but this is very worth saying, that, by the way, the best case scenario for lithium demand, like the least lithium demand, and also for all these other great transportation options, like all of us want more walkable cities, more bikeable cities, more tra uh, you know, train access, all of this, like that best case scenario is also the best case scenario for the climate crisis. Yeah. yeah. Right. And, and a lot of research shows that we don't reproduce that research because there's no point to it's like a very established fact in the literature on transportation decarbonization and, the yeah. cl and climate change, which is that the more you can just get people out of cars, even if you're putting them on a regular bus, not an electric yeah, bus, like yeah. the more you just literally get human beings into other modes of transportation, the faster we meet our climate targets. The slowest way to meet them is this one-to-one -one yeah. ICE EV swap. So there isn't a trade-off, and don't let anyone say that like, oh, you care more about protecting communities from mining than you do about the climate crisis. No, like no. if we care about the climate crisis, like we'd stop using cars. I mean, yeah, so exactly, exactly. Serious. Oh, I mean, that, it's music to my ears to hear. It's nice to have someone else who is actually an academic in this stuff say that because it's a drum that I bang regularly. Like, actually just shove everyone in diesel buses. It's like, that is so much better and more quickly better for the planet than converting everything to TVs. It's lovely to hear that. So, uh, and this this kind of graphic is, that if we go back to the Guardian graphic and it's kind of, I think that's essentially a representation, a similar representation exactly. to the, to the previous graph. It, you know, it's nice to have it graphically because it, it just really does show that there are two very different futures yeah. in terms of the volume of extraction. And then we also know in terms of getting to our climate goals faster and also all of the co-benefits that yeah, come of course, from, yeah. from more transportation options and for more equitable transportation systems. For sure. And then and then the last point is, uh, this is this is just oh, a- I a, love this. A, yeah, it's just an easy, we've we had the stupid hammer at the start and you just see it as an electric vehicle, what yep. that impact is, <laughs> just the enormous impact of um, you know, per rider of, and, of and that. We could, and we could add we could add modes of transportation here, for example, trolley buses. Oh, yes. Trolleys. Yeah. Now, in like, fact, well, the chat has been asking about trolley buses for sure. Trolley buses is great. Exactly, because those because of their their connection to the grid means that they don't need zero storage if you want them to be flexible and be able to go yeah, off yeah. route sometimes, which can have its benefits. But we're or you want backup if there's an outage. Right. However, the batteries for just storage in the case of an outage or a flexible route are way smaller needs yeah. than if you're only running on a battery, right? So having stuff connected to the grid is also great, and they're not even on here, but but that we could add them. Yeah, for sure. And of course, yeah, I, was gonna, I, I have to end it being, in theory, being a rail podcast, except we're not, we're just all transport. But yeah, trains, trains are good, folks. Right. There's a reason, and, and, well, and what, uh, US particularly, stick wires above it. <laughs> stick wires above it. It's a remarkably more effective way um, to, to help the planet than, than, than right. relying entirely on batteries like the current US class ones are desperately trying to do. Um, right. So, uh, Theo, we've just, I mean, we've, we've, we've overshot by three minutes, which actually for, for rail now is remarkably good time, but I'm, uh, you, you very kindly give me a lot of your time. Uh, I shall, in fact, the last point is, is kind of, and this is me being, uh, we had a little laugh at the start how, with how polemic a statement this is, but, but it's, it's one I stand by, which is the future is not one filled with lithium batteries. As you say, we're not going to avoid lithium batteries. They're everywhere around us. Um, and as you say, there are, you know, they're a little, you know, you can use them fine and, and you can create that much more sustainable cycle, but right. it's not, we're not filling the future with lithium batteries. That's not the future. That's, that cannot be the future. Yeah. Um, right. So, right. But I'm going to very quickly do my, my outro bits and pieces, then we'll come back. Um, so uh, everyone who's listened to this in audio only format, thank you so much. The new mic hopefully is working um, nicely uh, and and giving you all some nice sound quality compared to the old toaster mic. Um, uh, Patreon.com slash Gareth Dennis to support more of this happening. Gareth Dennis to UK slash merch for the merchandise. Uh, the, the Not a Metro sort is back, by the way. PayPal.me slash Gareth Dennis to throw abuse and lose change at me if you do so wish. And if you enjoyed the chat, which has been happening in anger, I have been looking at it, but actually we haven't had many questions. We've had lots of people just really nicely engaging with the content, which is lovely. I mean, if you do have questions, ch chuck them out. And if there's any good, quick questions, we can uh, perhaps Theo is willing to give us uh, 30 seconds to answer them. Uh, and the last one is Gareth Dent, UK slash Discord for, for, to continue the chat. Um, next week's episode, we're talking about why the National College for High Speed Rail went down the toilet. Uh, that's episode 170. Uh, we're now going to go to... And actually, I realized I didn't go to our two big faces almost at all through this episode because I was so cap captured by by what you're describing it and saying for you. That's been a fantastic episode. Thanks so much. Um, 
uh, there was a quick question from Zandovich about the modal shift assumptions for the four scenarios. Yeah. If people download the papers, presumably they can yeah. they can get they that are, information. They are, and I'll, and I'll even say there's like a 20-page appendix or something. So depending on how uh, intense you want to get, but that paper yeah, yeah. is free to download, fully translated into Spanish as well on the Climate and Community website. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Yeah, that's that's brilliant. And, and um, yeah, I, I, there's... Uh, uh, you know what we've oh actually tell you what um deirdre uh detour our, our resident statistical um expert uh is um looking at the complexity of the of the, of the modeling scenarios and, and asking about sensitivity of estimates to assumptions and, and what sensitivity analysis was was done I, but yeah but what, what, can you talk very brief i mean no I, the answer is no you can't talk briefly about it but because, uh, I, <laughs> I know what sensitivity analysis is so i understand the question but i'm not going to answer it because uh, we had a sort of uh, multimodal team, just to borrow okay, the metaphor. Yeah. So I led the qualitative stuff. Uh, I, I led the report and I helped, I, I sort of did a lot of the qualitative stuff along with several collaborators. And then Alyssa Kendall, who's an amazing okay. researcher and her graduate students, um, Christy and Meg, also worked on the quantitative modeling. And they have tons of experience. They do life cycle analysis. They do transportation analysis. They are just a powerhouse at University of California, Davis, that is at quite, you know, exactly at this intersection of mining, life cycle, and trans and modal kind of shifts. And so I won't I won't answer on the sensitivity question, no. but I think that should also be in the appendix. That's a perfect answer. It's an absolutely perfect okay. answer. Um, Thea, I won't ask any more questions because actually everyone, thanks everyone in the chat. You've, you've been great, actually. There's been some really interesting discussions going on in the chat that I've been kind of half trying to, like, that's all fine and good. And everyone's been very happy and some <laughs> lovely comments saying this has been a great episode. So thanks, Thea, so much. Uh, Thea, um, the last thing is any 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 anything you'd like, apart from going and finding the paper, going and watching you delivering other lectures, anything you want to plug or, or should also be people paying attention to anything coming out in the future, perhaps? You know, that... I, I don't know. Basically, uh, there's uh, uh, not to be annoying, but follow me on Twitter. The reason I Do say that. that is because I'll be organizing some events soon and, and virtual events, meaning that folks in, in the UK could participate. Uh, we'll be um, uh, doing an event soon on, on green industrial policy and the new Cold War with some collaborators. So anyway, okay. there'll be stuff, you know, follow me if you want to keep abreast of things. Uh, and I'll have some publications coming out uh, that I won't name yet because they haven't gone through the proofs. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. But you know, people people can see them, and I'm I'm pretty active there. And if people, you know, there's an email address that people can find uh, on my uh, on my official website. And yeah. Perfect. I will. I'll drop some. I'll add some links to the description, actually, particularly to the paper, so people can find that. Thea, I'm not going to take. I've taken seven minutes more of your time than I should have. Actually, I've taken an hour and seven minutes more. It's been an absolute That's pleasure. Great. Um, f from both of us, everyone. Thanks. Thanks for watching Rail now, and, 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 and cheerio. See you next week, Thea. Thank you Bye. so much. Thank you so much. This was great. <laughs> cheerio.